The End of Utopia by Russell Jacoby Chapter 3 Mass Culture and Anarchy Can it be denied that to live in a society of equals tends in general to make a man's spirits expand and his faculties work easily and actively? Can it be denied that to be heavily overshadowed, to be profoundly insignificant, has on the whole a depressing and denumbing or benumbing effect? This is Matthew Arnold, the 19th century poet and critic in Democracy, an essay he published in tandem with, the tit- with one titled Equality. With spirit and force, these pieces reaffirmed Arnold's egalitarian and democratic convictions. To those familiar with recent culture wars, the references might be surprising. The Arnold that filters through these polemics appears as an uncompromising defender of high culture against popular culture. He is the quintessential anti-democratic elitist. For conservatives, he is a hero, a stalwart defender of cultivation and learning. Many works from William J. Bennett's To Proclaim a Legacy and Dinesh D'Souza's Illiberal Education to Roger Kimball's Tenured Radicals Honor Arnold as upholding traditional standards, a 19th century rock against the mass culture and relativism of the late 20th century. Instead of aspiring to gain a thoughtful acquaintance with, as the Victorian poet and critic Matthew Arnold famously put it, the best that has been thought and said runs a typical passage. These new forces in the academy deliberately blur the distinction between high culture and popular culture. The Arnold who defended the best that has been thought and said and defined culture as a passion for sweetness and light. For many conservatives, this is Arnold. Conversely, for leftists and some liberals, he is a repellent elitist and reactionary. They view Arnold's central text, Culture and Anarchy, as nothing more than a thinly veiled defense of the old establishment against the new democratic society. Matthew Arnold, writes his most recent biographer, seems to have become a sort of easy shorthand for a notion of cold cultural arrogance and elitist disdain for mass culture. Although both right and left misread Arnold, if they read him, the issue is less Arnold than the understanding of mass culture. Over the decades, the lure and dazzle of mass culture has exponentially intensified Its audience extends in every direction. The position staked out by some conservatives, which has little changed over time, speaks for itself. They sanction fortifying the dikes. The position staked out by liberals and leftists, which has changed, raises questions. Once upon a time, they believed in a new and better culture for people. No longer. In the name of democracy, they anoint the daily fare of entertainment and movies. Their confidence in a transformed future has evaporated. Arnold serves as a symbol in the culture wars, but he deserves better. He offered an approach to mass culture that should be resuscitated. Along with John Stuart Mill and Alexis de Tocqueville, Arnold endorsed democracy and equality. At the same time, the great 19th century liberal thinkers did not fetishize these categories. They remained alert to outcomes and contexts, assailing, leveling, the tyranny of the majority or uniformity. They understood that supporting equality in democracy did not entail approving all its configurations. On the contrary, they often protested what in today's idiom might be called mass culture. They were Democrats and egalitarians willing to criticize everyday culture and opinions no matter how entrenched or popular. In the current climate, their willingness shows up as unacceptable elitism. Contemporary political thinkers lack the boldness of the 19th century liberals. That people are equal and should be treated equally is one matter. That their thoughts and activities are equal is another. The second does not follow from the first or at least it does not directly follow. It must first pass through history and society. 
This means that the principle of human equality and its concrete expression in society are not the same. By virtue of inif- inf- by virtue of inferior education or destructive conditions, equal people develop unequally. This is not an insult, but an observation, and indeed an observation on which pivots a criticism of society. Mill and Arnold perfectly understood this, as did 20th century critics like Dwight MacDonald. Today this wisdom seems lost. Scholars and critics have surrendered to an inexorable logic of equality. Since all people are equal, then everything they do must be equal, goes the reasoning. Loyal to this logic, they reject criticism of mass culture as elitist, because it supposes that some things are superior to others. They view the criticism of culture advanced by Arnold or MacDonald as demeaning. In place of the old elitism, new critics embrace mass culture as complex terrains of subversion and contestation. These approaches open doors to studying topics from jazz to comic books that earlier scholars ignored. This is all for the good, yet in casting aside as elitist truth, individuality, and perfection, notions that animated Arnold and Mill, today's critics also close the door to a different future. They ratify the status quo in the name of democracy. Despite their claims of subversion, they subvert the effort to go beyond the existing society. They block the utopian impulse that pervaded the critique of mass culture. The Renaissance scholar John C. Olin detected a utopian note in Arnold's call to turn a stream of fresh and free thought upon our stock notions and habits, and in his hope that culture, as the development of perfection, would be the great help out of our present difficulties. Arnold sought, wrote Olin, an intellectual and moral enlightenment. It is a democratic social ideal. The 19th century critic denounced the culture of his day in the name of something better, a more thoughtful and graceful culture. Today, most observers and scholars reject this as naive and elitist. In confounding criticism and elitism, they back themselves into a world without exit. Almost 30 years ago, the German poet and essayist Hans Magnus Enzensberger complained of what he called the cultural archaism of the left. He charged that the new left analyzed the media through a single concept, manipulation, that saw the masses as dupes. For Enzensberger, not only was the manipulation thesis unsatisfactory, It meant that young political activists spurned contact with television, preferring pre-industrial modes. Ironically, the left, which presented itself as the future, looked backward. Young leftists disdained the mass media. Of course, this was the this was the not. Of course, this was the not the holy. Fuck, the sentence is not structured properly. Of course, this was not the whole story. (laughs) They have multiple does in the sentence that shouldn't be there. Some activists, notably Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin in the United States, utilized the mass media, mainly television. It wasn't through traditional political organizing, reading books and getting leaflets and hearing arguments, stated Rubin about the cascading campus riots in the late 1960s. It was through being turned on by something they saw on television. Though this may be partly a self-delusion, Rubin's enthusiasm for television represented a minority opinion. Enzensberger's observation captured the widespread sentiment. Few cared to understand what the media did or how it operated. The new left generally viewed the media as the enemy's fiefdom. In Berkeley, Enzensberger noted, students assailed computers as a symbol of oppression. During the May events in Paris of 1968, the reversion to archaic forms of production was particularly characteristic. Instead of carrying out agitation among workers with a modern offset, the students printed their posters on the hand presses of the École des Beaux-Arts. The political... Slogans were hand-painted. It was not the radio headquarters that were seized by the rebels, 
but the Odeon Theatre. Today, the situation has completely changed. Few subscribe to notions of manipulation and fewer scorn the mass media. A cultural archaism that abhorred the mass media developed into a leftist cultural studies that more or less adores it. Of course, a straight line does not lead from the 1960s hostility to the media uh, to its embrace 30 years later, nor is a capacious cultural studies the single outcome of the 1960s. Yet a fundamental shift in intellectual sensibilities has taken place, and the distance traveled is most visible in cultural studies, which is left-wing in its origin and orientation. Cultural studies defies a brief description. Very broadly, it denotes an academic field spanning several specialties that has moved away from studying past works of high culture to analyzing contemporary popular culture from pornography to sports. A democratic and populist impulse permeates the field. Even the most cursory look at its new anthologies finds lengthy and appreciative articles on rock videos, menswear, TV talk shows, and soap operas. A recent collection includes studies by second-generation professors who no longer feel obligated to make the case that television, television serials are an appropriate object of scholarly inquiry. Articles like The Role of Soap Opera in the Development of Feminist Television Scholarship suggest a new world of academic studies. To earlier sensibilities, the notion of feminist television scholarship is itself jarring, much less the, the role of soap operas within that scholarship. The transition does not simply signify a, a regression. As Enzensberger argued, the thesis that evil managers tricked passive masses suffered from grave weaknesses. Earlier critics often subscribed to this supposition. Ours is the first age in which many thousands of the best-trained individual minds have made it a full-time business, wrote Marshall McLuhan in his 1951 study of advertising, to get inside the collective public mind in order to manipulate, exploit, and control. Few today would second this statement from the mechanical bride. Even McLuhan rapidly backed off. He reflected a few years later that he had attempted a defense of book of book culture against the new media. My strategy was wrong because my obsession with literary values blinded me to much that was actually happening. Or, as he stated more emphatically later, he, did, he decided to give up the moralizing of the mechanical bride for no point of view. Although McLuhan hardly caused the shift, he led the way. Within a few years, he glided from critic to booster of the mass media. Several reasons might be offered to explain the wider transformation among critics and scholars. The war in Vietnam convinced skeptics that politics gets played out in the mass media. From the war footage on television to the Pentagon papers and newspapers, activists and radicals concluded that the mass media could shape public opinion. At the same time, the generation that drew this lesson grew up with the mass media and came to prize it. In his book on intellectuals and popular culture, No Respect, Andrew Ross outlines what he calls the transition from the last generation of American intellectuals to swear unswerving allegiance to the printed word and the dictates of European taste to his own generation, immersed in American popular culture. Unlike the last generation, the new does not reject out-of-hand commercialization or the creativity of consumption. Coming of age with television formed the basis for an appreciation. It did not shock as it did the previous generation, but seduced and charmed. Television culture, writes James B. Twitchell in his Carnival Culture, is my culture. I've watched it all my life. I was weaned on that zenith of his parents. At some mysterious point in the 1950s, television ceased to be just an odd-looking gizmo and entered the bloodstream. It became us. It is who we are. I've watched several hours of television every day for most of my life, writes David Mark in his book on television and literacy, and that 
and that adds up to tens of thousands of lifetime hours in front of the set. This experience shared by many of his generation prompted a very different approach than that of earlier critics. Television unsettled the older critics, according to Mark. All feared the threat of a total corporate takeover of culture. All dreaded the consequences of the outmoding of their craft. Us was culture. Them was television. Us were elitists and often European refugees, which made their criticism of mass culture questionable. Elites have always made Americans uneasy. Sociologists like Herbert Gans and Edward Schills added their expertise to this suspicion. The critics of the mass media were not only elitists. They were elitists losing their status in the fluid American society. The critics belonged to a pre-bourgeois order of courts and patrons threatened by American democracy. To salvage their status, they fetishized elitist creativity and scorned the larger audience. The critics faced a drastic downward social mobility and consequently produced an ideology of resentment or expressed in the formulation of the mass culture critique. For Gans, this was strictly un-American. Most of the critics, he observed, have been Europeans or Americans who were descended descendants from the European elite or who modeled themselves on it. Real Americans love mass culture. In an often cited attack, Schills stated that the criticism of mass culture derived from disappointed political prejudices and resentment against American society, whereas in Europe an educated person of the higher classes could avoid awareness of the life of the majority of the population this is impossible in the United States. What is a vague disdain in Europe must become an elaborate loathing in America. Or, as another commentator put it, the United States does not provide a sheltered niche for the European intellectuals or accord them the deference and caste privileges which they regard as their due. For American scholars, and in particular those raised after World War II, the criticism of mass culture evoked snobbishness and privilege. One historian believes that the harried, often intemperate attacks by older intellectuals on mass culture should be seen as acts of exclusion and self-definition. They demonstrated authority by denouncing mass culture. To be a serious intellectual in America required that one be opposed to the insidious, leveling forces of mass culture, showing too much respect for mass culture writes George Kotkin, could even bring forth doubts about one's own intellectual credentials. This, inza- this anxiety blinded observers to richness of mass and pop- popular culture. Kotkin's generation, free of anxiety, embraces mass culture. The oeuvre and reception of Dwight MacDonald reflects the shifting perspective on mass culture. By virtue of his essays and journalism, MacDonald, who died in 1982, belongs in the ranks of leading 20th century American intellectuals. His 1963 article in the New Yorker on the Invisible Poor, which drew attention to Michael Harrington's neglected The Other America, is usually credited with reigniting the American debate on poverty. Several of MacDonald's essays remain the most uncompromising assaults on mass culture, and in the course of various revisions, he hardened, not softened, his position, for instance, retitling his Theory of Popular Culture, first a theory of mass culture, and then mass cult and mid-cult, to indicate his disenchantment. It is sometimes called popular culture, he explained, admitting he had used the phrase himself, but I think mass culture a more accurate term, since its distinctive mark is that it is solely and directly an article of mass consumption, like chewing gum. MacDonald, a maverick leftist, reviled mass culture as base and exploitative. Nor did he curb his criticism because it might sully his democratic credentials. Whenever a lord of mass cult is reproached for the low quality of his products, he automatically reposts, But that's what the public wants. What can I do? For MacDonald, however, the rejoinder does not wash. 
It does not consider that the wants of the public do not arise spontaneously, but are conditioned and manufactured. In his earlier and more Marxist terminology, he stated, Mass culture is imposed, is imposed from above. It is fabricated by technicians hired by businessmen. Its audiences are passive consumers, their participation limited to the choice between buying and not buying. The lords of kitsch, in short, exploit the cultural needs of the masses in order to make a profit and or to maintain their class rule. MacDonald was well aware of the charges of elitism. For some reason, objections to the giving to the public, what it wants line, are often attacked as undemocratic and snobbish. Yet it is precisely because I do believe in the potentialities of ordinary people that I criticize mass cult. He could not understand how leftists could defend mass culture or the masses. To Marx's fetishism of commodities, I would counterpose our modern fetishism, that of the masses. In 1959, he gave a talk on mass culture to a student group that was soon to play a role in the new left. The response surprised him. What I was not prepared for was the reaction to my attacks on our mass culture. These were resented in the name of democracy. Hollywood, to me, was an instance of exploitation rather than satisfying of popular tastes. But to some of those who took to the floor after my talk, Hollywood was a genuine expression of the masses. They seemed to think it snobbish of me to criticize our movies and television. This response by these early new leftists anticipated the future. Although several sympathetic biographies of MacDonald have appeared, for contemporary cultural studies, scholars MacDonald is, at best, irrelevant and at worst, unacceptable. In Left Intellectuals in Popular Culture, young historian Paul R. Gorman sets forth the new conventional wisdom. MacDonald today, we are told, is most often invoked as an example of what went wrong with mass culture criticism. Contemporary critics and writers now generally agree that the analyses put forth by MacDonald and his fellow critics were misguided. Newer and more sophisticated work denies that people are directly manipulated. The successors to MacDonald operate with a more flexible conception of culture, and they disdain judging with fixed values. Gorman welcomes this new phase, calling it the decline of criticism. A move towards celebration can probably be charted in the abandonment of the term mass culture as derogatory and elitist. The phrase mass culture, writes historian Patrick Brantlinger, originated in discussion of mass movements and the effects of propaganda campaigns, film, and radio shortly before the outbreak of World War II. From the outset, he notes, it has carried negative connotations. The term mass culture seems to have been spawned by notions of mass society, which in turn derived from the masses, which were generally viewed as a danger. The term was interchangeable with hoi polloi, rabble, canai, the great unwashed. For observers from the 19th century to the present, the masses, as well as mass society, mass psychology, and mass culture threatened civilization. The masses were sometimes crowds, mobs, and rabble. Freud's 1922 booklet, Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego, which considers one threat to civilization, might be more accurately translated as mass psychology and the analysis of the ego. Even Matthew Arnold used the term gingerly as too derogatory, referring to the spurious culture delivered to the English population. He stated, Plenty of people will try to give the masses as they call them. Previous generations of leftists rarely bothered to criticize mass culture because they thought its flaws were self-evident. Moreover, many were convinced that the prevailing culture would vanish with the bourgeoisie itself. Popular in mass culture was bourgeois culture. In the future society, all would enjoy the elite culture. One veteran of the communist movement recalled the teachings he heard as a youth. The saxophone is not a real instrument. Jazz and certainly popular music were all capitalist expressions. In my adolescent mind, there was a day when the revolution would come and there would be no popular music. Everybody would listen to Beethoven. 
Others believe that the working class incarnated not only a superior economic and social system, but a superior culture. In its crudest form, the adherents of the Soviet proletarian culture movement supposed that workers must immediately create their own socialist forms of thought, feeling, and daily life. Devotees of socialist realism called for a break with bourgeois decadence and pessimism. New revolutionary art would be optimistic, joyous, and heroic. Even those distant from the Soviet approach believed that the culture of the working class was different from and superior to the culture of the middle class. It anticipated a more humane future. Today, few still believe this, certainly not exponents of cultural studies. Herein lies a, re a revealing irony. Contemporary cultural studies, with its sympathetic interpretations of mass culture, largely derives from a, from a British socialism that sought to keep mass culture at bay. The British radicals wanted to salvage a distinct class-based culture. They subscribed to the idea of a working-class culture, which they saw endangered by mass culture. The threat to traditional working-class life, writes one account, was crucial for the early development of cultural studies. Richard Hoggart's The Uses of Literacy, usually dubbed a founding work in cultural studies, celebrated working-class culture and railed at mass culture for sum submerging it. To current leftists, the socialist Hoggart probably sounds like a conservative. Most mass, most mass entertainments are in the end what D.H. Lawrence described as anti-life. They are full of corrupt brightness of improper appeals and moral evasions. They tend towards a view of the world in which progress is conceived as a seeking of material possessions, equally as moral leveling and freedom as the ground for endless irresponsibly irresponsible pleasure. They tend towards uniformity. Working people are being presented continually with encouragements towards an unconscious uniformity. This has not yet been hollow this has not yet been found hollow by most people, because it is expressed most commonly as an invitation to share in a kind of palliness, even though in a huge and centralized palliness. Hawkart became the first director of the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, a key institution in the promotion of cultural studies. Other main contributors to cultural studies, such as E.P. Thompson and Raymond Williams, also devoted themselves to documenting and defending working class culture. Thompson's classic, The Making of the English Working Class, can be viewed as a long argument for the centrality of working class culture. The making of the working class, he stated, is a fact of political and cultural as much as of economic history. Williams devoted much of his life to resisting mass culture. I thought the Labour government had a choice, Williams reminisced, about the post-World War II period, either for reconstruction of the cultural field in capitalist terms, or for funding institutions of popular education and popular culture that could have withstood the bourgeois press. I still believe that the failure to fund the working class movement culturally led to its demise in the 1950s. Williams also spent 15 years as a teacher in adult education, mainly under the auspices of the Workers' Educational Association. As one account put it, Williams wanted very much to work in adult education because of class loyalty and identification. Nor was he an exception. Hoggart and Thompson also dedicated themselves to adult education. They committed themselves to teaching and listening to an adult population largely composed of working individuals who could not afford the time and money for a regular university education. These educators hoped to salvage a working class culture. As Williams stated, it was distinctly as a vocation rather than a profession that people went into adult education. Edward Thompson, Hoggart himself, or myself. The British Adult Education Group, itself the successor to a working class education movement, gave rise to cultural studies. Tom Steele, who has written a history of its origins, observes that cultural studies began as a political project of popular education amongst adults. However, he continues, few traces of these allegiances surface in contemporary cultural studies. 
Students now think that it sprang fully armed from the side of a university department of English. Practitioners of cultural studies do not know, forget, or cast aside the original cause and motivation. In a lecture near the end of his life, Williams tried to set the record, set the record right. We are beginning, I am afraid, to see encyclopedia articles dating the birth of cultural studies from this or that book of the late 50s. Don't believe a word of it. That shift of perspective began in adult education. It didn't happen anywhere else. Today, to speak of adult education or salvaging working class culture as political projects sounds quaint. <clears throat> One appraisal of the impact of the British school remarks that notions of class are not central to the current fashion and cultural studies. At best, working class culture is history, and if E.P. Thompson and the original cultural studies school have a loyal following, it is among, it is among labor historians who want to record the past struggles of the working class. They want to do more than record. They also believe that the working class possessed a distinct vision or viable labor culture that challenged a dreary liberalism. However, the very few, or however, very few argue that a distinct working class culture still exists in the Western industrial nations. <clears throat> As one labor historian put it, the fact is that mass culture has won. There is nothing else. This proposition does not derive from a lack of revolutionary rectitude or conceptual rigor. Rather, it stems from an observation difficult to challenge the decay of a working class movement and the demise of its unique culture. In numbers and proportions, factory labor constitutes less and less of the laboring population. Culturally, a working class merges with the wider society, who seriously argues that a working class today represents a distinct cultural entity. <clears throat> what happens to cultural studies when its original object to working class culture vaporizes? If nature does not abhor a vacuum, intellectuals do. Knock off French theories and instant Gramsci fill up the spaces. The orientation of cultural studies changes from criticizing to interpreting, reading, deconstructing, and increasingly championing mass culture. The discipline began to celebrate commercial culture, notes Simon During, a professor of English and cultural studies who approves the shift. It turned away from the highly theoretical attacks by arguing that at least some popular cultural products themselves have positive quasi-political effects. He gives an example, an interpretation of Madonna as delivering pleasure and a feminist ideology critique to her fans. To During, such work is refreshing because it rejects the hierarchies that support monocultures, and it does not condescend to actual popular culture practices. Where does this lead? To an embrace of mass culture. Gorman's left intellectuals and popular culture opens by repudiating those who denounce television. TV bashing is only the most recent expression of a general bias against mass entertainment that has been held by American intellectuals in the modern era. The newer and younger professors transcend the bias, rel relishing mass culture. Alan Wolfe summarizes the shift. Roll over, Beethoven, is the anthem. Whatever the literati once denounced, cultural studies will uphold. Romance novels, Star Trek, heavy metal, Disneyland, punk rock, wrestling, Muzak, Dallas. If shopping centers were for an earlier generation of Marxists, symbols of the fetishism of commodities, then contemporary advocates of cultural studies find them overwhelming and constitutively paradoxical. If Rambo can be seen as little more than a moneymaker, he also represents the vulnerability of the American male. Yet the choices have never been either or, either celebrate high culture or champion mass culture. This is easy to distort or forget, as if proponents of elite culture simply dismissed mass and popular culture. In fact, they have often expounded on the symbiotic relationship between high and popular culture, lamenting the grievous split. Van Wyck Brooks, 
who popularized the terms highbrow and lowbrow, thought the separation harmful. Twenty, even ten years ago, he wrote in 1915, it would have been universally assumed that the only hope for American society lay in somehow lifting the lowbrow elements into the level of the highbrow elements. Now, however, it is plain that highbrow culture by itself produces a glassy, inflexible priggishness, which paralyzes life, and that the lower levels have a certain community, flexibility, tangibility. Or, as he put it, slang has quite as much in store for so-called culture as culture has for slang. The argument between the exponents of high culture and those of popular culture is often more rhetorical than substantial. At least the issue may be less the grand theoretical formulations than the cogency of, spe of specific studies. On an abstract plane, the propositions that corporations crank out mass culture to make a profit and that people do more than passively receive cultural offerings are both true. Nor can a call advanced by cultural studies for a more nuanced reading of mass culture be rejected. On the contrary, openness should inform any study. To state this more strongly, an argument to take seriously the stuff of everyday life and culture, the icons, rituals, images, is unexceptionable. Conversely, an argument or stance that refuses to consider popular culture sabotages thought. The problem is not the determination to take popular culture seriously, nor is it the name-dropping pro, prolgomenon with drabs of Bart, Foucault, and Gramsci. Rather, it is the failure to say anything illuminating. The ailment is not the banality of the subject matter, but the banality of the analysis. lost my spot but the banality of the analysis this is the heart of the matter the self-satisfied break with old elitism can be tolerated perhaps even applauded the incessant repetition of the new academic commonplaces however betrays the project these are not gutsy scholars plowing new ground but cautious souls trimming their front lawns the triteness generally derives from a theoretical jargon that strangles any thought and an, insistent, and an insistence on finding subversion or complexity everywhere. These give a fabricated cast to many of the writings on popular culture. The typical essay splices together references to the theoretical masters, defers to the earlier path-breaking professors, usually just a few years earlier praises the boldness of the project, and, finally reaching the subject at hand, comes up with a string of formulations on paradox, ambiguity, and subversion. Though it is easy to caricature the old critics of mass culture, in fact these cranky elitists took very seriously the stuff of everyday life and entertainment, their essays often crackled with intelligence and insight, from the 1930s in Little Magazines to the 1960s in Esquire, MacDonald wrote about movies with an earthiness that stayed clear of high theory and its pretensions. The trouble with most film criticism today, he once complained, is that it isn't criticism. It is, rather, appreciation, celebration, information by insiders who are able to discourse learnedly about any aspect of film, but ignore whether it is good. The very question must strike them as a little naive and irrelevant. MacDonald might be known for his attacks on mass culture and mass cult, but his real claim to fame are his essays on specific institutions and subjects like popular novelists, the great books, the new third edition of Webster's New International Dictionary and America's love affair with how-to books and facts. For instance, a passage from his essay, The Triumph of the Fact, reads, Our mass culture, and a good deal of our high or serious culture, is dominated by an emphasis on data, by a frank admiration of the factual, and an uneasy contempt for imagination, sensibility, and speculation. We are obsessed with technique, hag-ridden by facts, in love with information, 
Our popular novelists must tell us all about the historical and professional backgrounds of their puppets. Our press lords make millions by giving us this day our daily fact. Our way of following a sport is to amass an extraordinary amount of data about batting averages, past performances, yards gained, etc., so that many Americans who can't read without moving their lips have a fund of sports scholarship. In the same way, the theoretical framework for McLuhan's mechanical bride might seem simple, but the book itself consists of reflections brimming with insights, references, and wit on print advertisements. An advertisement for shaving cream that opens with the line, for the one man in seven who shaves daily, allowed McLuhan to range widely over the issue of phony and real polls. He pondered the usual appeal that two out of three people do this or have bought that. He considered the close connection between opinion polls and, and consumer poll surveys. He quoted Gertrude Stein that the funniest thing that the funniest thing expatriates in Paris discovered about America after World War II was the Gallup poll. When a man can take a poll and tell what everybody is thinking, that means nobody is really thinking anymore. McLuhan reflected that a political machine wants to have exact knowledge of how to weigh its electoral program in the same way as big business probes consumers to modify its product. Both call in the scientists. While it is difficult to obtain a sample of social blood or tissue, it is no exaggeration to say that the pollsters with their questionnaires are out for blood. When they get their sample, they analyze it and turn the results over to their masters, who then decide what sort of shot in the arm the public needs. Even the uncompromising elitists of the Frankfurt School, which included neo-Marxist scholars like Herbert Marcuse and T.W. Adorno, wrote incisive evaluations of mass culture phenomena. Siegfried Krakauer, who belonged to its outer circles, viewed the Tiller Girls, synchronized dancers of the 1920s, as a clue to larger social forces. He believed contemporary society could be understood less by studying its philosophers than by scrutinizing its inconspicuous surface-level expressions, like its fads and fashions. By virtue of their unconscious nature, these popular phenomena provide unmediated access to the fundamental substance of the state of things, he, as well as the others in the Frankfurt School, took this proposition seriously. Krakauer wrote with warmth and acuity about film, hotel lobbies, and bestsellers. I was still a young boy when I saw my first film, Krakauer wrote in the preface to Theory of Film. Its intoxicating impression caused the very young Krakauer to set down his thoughts in a piece with a long-winded title. Film as the discoverer of the marvels of everyday life. Throughout his career, Krakauer examined popular culture. For instance, in 1925, he published a study of detective novels, which was dedicated to T.W. Adorno. Adorno himself wrote about television and radio as well as a lengthy consideration of the Los Angeles Times astrology column. Make your appearance more charming early then contact co-workers and make plans for more efficient and harmonious arrangement of future routine chores, cited Adorno from a 1953 Aries forecast. The stars counsel practicality and conformity, according to Adorno. Although historians have studied astrology, few scholars have tackled the significance of modern astrology. Yet here is Adorno, the archetype archetypical elitist, leaving through three months of the Los Angeles Times to figure out what astrological publications mean. Even today, few have followed him. Leo Lowenthal and Norbert Guterman also wrote about mass culture. They published a book-length study of the speeches of American right-wing propagandists, many of which were aired on radio. In 1943, in 1940, sorry, 1942, Lowenthal analyzed the shifting taste in biographical features that ran in popular magazines. Who were the individuals selected? What characteristics were highlighted? And how did they change over time? 
Surprisingly, he noted not very much attention has been paid to this phenomenon. He found that compared to the heroes of business and manufacturing at the turn of the century, the new heroes of the early 1940s came from the world of sports and entertainment. To be sure, the writings on mass culture by Adorno and his associates do not always distinguish themselves. They could be heavy-handed and wrong-headed. A dispute continues to simmer as to why Adorno misunderstood jazz. Nevertheless, the critics of mass culture did not ignore the phenomena and often wrote provocative analyses. <clears throat> Conversely, the new populists obsess about mass culture and revel in banality. The issue is not the overreaching theoretical framework, but its bearing in particular studies. The new students are not wrong to take mass culture seriously. The problem is their findings. Their approaches can be faulted not in general, but in particular. They ring their essays with announcements of audacity and deliver the, ac the academic blather of our time. The examples are endless. A collection of new television criticism, channels of discourse, brutes that it represents a fundamental departure from pre-structuralist or traditional criticism. Traditional approaches looked for enduring truths about the world. Contemporary criticism views meaning as the product of the engagement of a text by a reader or by groups of readers and considers the worlds construct constructed within the texts. The drift seems clear. The move is away from a familiar denunciation in the name of fixed standards to an appreciation of the complexity of television. Again, though this may be accept acceptable as a broad formulation, the real weakness surfaces in the particular studies. The first essay, true to the form, expends the bulk of its pages rephrasing the ideas of various semioticians semi before demonstrating the power of high-octane theory. Semiotics allows us to describe the process of connotation, the relationship of signs within a system, and the nature of signs themselves. The author gives an example. A semiotic analysis of the opening credit sequence for The Cosby Show. The sequence lasts one minute. The analysis, seven pages. The Cosby sequence has been chosen, writes Ellen Sider, because it is something that may have been seen repeatedly, not just by the semiotician, who must go over the text a huge number of times in order to analyze it, but also by the average viewer. The huge number of times Sider suffered the sequence yielded a chart with observations like the following. <clears throat> Signifier. Computer graphic resembling theater marquee with, non, with neon lights. Signified NBC logo or close-up one shot Cosby nods head to music. Smiles, eyes raised. She continues for several pages before rehearsing the theory and stating the conclusion. Semiotics argues, we are informed, that the meaning of every sign derives in part from its relationship to others with which it is associated in the same sign system. Some of the meaning of this sequence then derives from its difference from the credit sequences of other TV shows. Cider boldly concludes that synt syntagmatic structure of the opening credits might be described as a theme and variations where Cosby is the theme and each child and his wife appear as variations. The other essays follow this formula, lethal theory followed by lame conclusions, and sometimes death. E. Anne Kaplan tells us about Kristeva, Lacan, and pre-Althusserian Marxist feminists, before getting down to the business of MTV. In the case of MTV, for example... Instead of the channel evoking aspects of the Lacanian mirror phase, ideal image -o, it instead evokes issues of split subjectivity and the alienation that the mirror image involves. Freudian theory may not apply, however, since the videos are too short. There's no possibility within the four-minute segment, Kaplan astutely points out, for reject for regression to the Freudian Oedipal conflicts. Yet even Professor Kaplan is not certain what is up or down. 
It is often difficult to know precisely what a rock video actually means because its signifiers are not linked along a coherent, logical chain that produces one unambiguous message. Nevertheless, she gives it a try analyzing a Madonna video, Material Girl, which is particularly useful since it exemplifies the establishment of a unique kind of intertextual relationship. She describes the scenes and sequences with commentary like the following. In Jameson's terms, this lack of criticism in the video makes the process pastiche rather than parody and puts it in the postmodern mode. The blurring of the diegetic spaces further suggests postmodernism, as does the following confusion of enunciated sorry, enunciative stances in the visual track. Moving from the video to the person, Kaplan concludes that Madonna represents post-feminism. She's neither particularly male nor female identified and seems mainly to be out for herself. Thanks. A very important conclusion. Professor Kaplan underlines her breakthrough. This analysis of Material Girl has shown the ambiguity of enunciative positions within the video that in turn is responsible for the ambiguous representations of the female image. Or as John Fisk puts it in an other essay on Madonna, her image becomes then not a model, not a model meaning for young girls in patriarchy, but a, a site of semiotic struggle between the forces of patriarchal control and feminine resistance, of capitalism and the subordinate, of the adult and the young. The editors of the Cultural Studies Reader introduce an essay on shopping malls by calling it wide-ranging and an exemplary instance of contemporary cultural studies. Yet the essay by Megan Morris exemplifies only how much jargon, theoretical chit-chat, and self-reference can be stuffed into 25 pages. The essay vainly circles about what a study of shopper or of shopping centers might be. My difficulty in the shopping center project will thus be not simply by re- my relation as intellectual to the culture I'm speaking about, but to whom I will imagine that I will be speaking. However, in making that argument, I also evaded the problem of other rather than ordinary women. I slid from restating the now conventional case that an image of a woman shopping is not a real First, I want to make a detour to consider the second inquiry I've had from other women. In virtually her own specific observation, Morris notes that the benches in the Green Hills shopping center are brightly colored, which ratifies the garden motif. This discovery summons up a reference to Walter Benjamin in the Parisian Flaneur. I want to argue that it is precisely the proclaimed dissolution of public and private on the botanized asphalt of shopping town today that makes possible, not a flaneuse, since that term becomes anachronistic, but a practice of modernity by women for which it is most important not to begin by identifying heroines and victims, even of conflicts with male paranoia, but a profound ambivalence about shifting roles. As if this might be too clear or forthright, Morris hurries to add, yet here again I want to differentiate or consider on a very different terrain a semiotic effort to decode the American breakfast by looking at it not as a meal, but rather as a system, a collection of units or elements that are structured in some way. There is what might be thought of as a breakfast code. The author rejects temperature, color, or shape as the code before unlocking the door, the transformation from solid to liquid, and vice versa. Looking at her tip Looking at the typical American breakfast, Professor Arthur Asa Berger finds, orange juice is a solid that becomes a liquid. Coffee is a drink made from a solid, coffee beans. Sugar is a solid that becomes a liquid, and then a solid again. Cornflakes is a solid that becomes a liquid, and then made into a solid gra- uh, solid again. Butter is a liquid that becomes a solid. Eggs are liquid and become solid. The other items, bread, bacon, and potatoes, are solids that remain solids, while milk and cream are solids, since cows eat grass, that become liquids. 
(laughs) The conclusion to these observations, Americans eat breakfast in order to transform themselves in the same way as their food is transformed into liquids or solids. Okay. Important stuff. The message of the classic American breakfast is disguise and endless transformation. Professor Berger might want to consider lunch. (laughs) Several cultural studies professors argue that video has changed the experience of viewing, encouraging a mastery over the narrative. Henry Jenkins cites a colleague who states that video has enabled TV to take on an emphatically Brechtian reflexivity. Jenkins adds that this new relationship to the broadcast image allows the fans liminal movement between a relationship of intense proximity and one of more ironic distance. If this is not clear, he quotes a fan of multiple viewings of Star Wars. Each time I see it, a new level or idea about something in it shows itself. As to the complaint that the characters were shallow and there's no background, nitpicky, there's part, that's part of the fun. Jenkins concludes that her understanding of the film has become progressively more elaborate with each new viewing as she made inferences that took her well beyond the information explicitly present it, presented. Star Wars fandom may indeed be one of the most extraordinary examples of the productivity of the interpretative, interpretative process. The inability of cultural studies scholars to write a sentence is by now a familiar observation. It bears repeating for at least one reason. Half the hoopla about cultural studies derives from its claim to be writing on behalf of the people. Its practitioners are breaking with an old elitism that dismissed popular culture. Yet the old elitists, like MacDonald, wrote in crisp and lucid sentences that any educated person could read. The cultural studies exponents, in general, offer fractured English, jargon, and sentences that could bring tears to a 10th grade English teacher. They trample the culture they supposedly love. MacDonald's essay on how on how two books begins this way. The way to deal with eelworm in flocks is to spray with mer- Murphos, a paraltrian curb. The way to avoid being slighted by bus drivers, waiters, and sales, gir- sales-, sales girls is to be unselfish, self-confident, thoughtful, enthusiastic, and happy. The way to stop a long-winded speaker is for the chairman to rise. Thank him for his splendid contribution and lead the audience in thunderous applause. The way to resist a male seducer is for the lady to sit in an armless straight chair and pop a piece of salt water taffy into her mouth every time he is about to kiss her. The above useful information is a dipperful from the great American reservoir of know-how. Morris on Shopping Centers opens. The first thing I want to do is to cite a definition of modernity. It comes not from a recent not from recent debates in feminist theory or aesthetics or cultural studies, but from a paper called Development in the Retail Scene, given in Perth in 1981 by John Lennon of Meyer Shopping Centres. To begin his talk to a seminar organized by the Australian Institute of Urban Studies. The point hardly needs emphasizing. The stuff that parades its break with elitism, its subversiveness, and its populist commitments reeks of insularity and conformity. Arnold deserves attention, both for what he has to say and for what he reveals about current approaches to culture. Although not a professional philosopher, He offers a platform to assess mass culture that has hardly been bettered, that both left and right misread Arnold as part of the problem. (coughs) To put it briefly, Arnold put together what many contemporary thinkers believe cannot be joined, an uncompromising critique of popular culture with uncompromising democratic commitments. Arnold is surely well known. Arnold was the most influential critic of his age stated Lionel Trilling 60 years ago. 
the estimate must be as unequivocal as this. For well over a century, few critics have maintained a comparable standing and influence. No other foreign critic, and perhaps few native ones, have acquired such a reputation and exercised such a palpable influence on American culture, stated one study over 30 years ago. Arnold was the significant or the single most significant disseminator of the, cred, of the creed of culture, wrote the historian Lawrence Levine a few years ago. Yet Arnold is also unknown. His life and commitments explode conventional political categories. Conservatives extract from Arnold a single idea, the significance of high culture. Meanwhile, they do not breathe a word of Arnold's aggressive defense of public education and social equality, equality or his assault upon the market, all of which sustained his justification of high culture. Conversely, liberals and leftists surrender a vital and radical notion of Arnold's, his criticism of individualism and implicitly of mass culture. In dismissing Arnold, they gut the utopian vision that sustained his thought. Except for biographers and historians, Arnold's life and career as an educator, specifically as inspector of schools, passes unnoticed. Conservatives who love to cite Arnold rarely mention it. A basic study, Matthew Arnold in American Culture, has no index entry, entry under schools or teaching or education. Yet for 35 years, Arnold was His Majesty's Inspector of Schools, and this was no honorary appointment. Arnold plotted about, examined, and questioned. This was his day job and more. He incessantly addressed education, not simply in regular reports, but in talks, essays, and books. Much of his collected works deal with education, including his longest book, Schools and Universities on the Continent. Nor were these concerns extraneous to his more widely read cultural writings. On the contrary, his ideas on education infuse his most famous work, Culture and Anarchy. Arnold was not a socialist, nor was he a conservative. In the context of Anglo-American thought, he was a radical in this regard. He believed that the state should take responsibility for the education of the people, and, indeed, for culture in general. He also believed in egalitarianism and objected to sharp disparities in wealth. These were not separate propositions. For Arnold, a robust public education, a solid social equality, and a vibrant culture all went together. To square the real Arnold with the current portrait of him as an elite snob is not possible. With a notable lack of enthusiasm, in 1851, at the age of 29, Matthew Arnold became a royal inspector of education, charged with examining schools and students and writing regular reports. Though I am a schoolmaster's son, he stated at his retirement, I confess that school teaching or school inspecting is not the line of life I should naturally have chosen. I adopted it in order to marry a lady. He also toured European schools several times and wrote up his findings. His first report after visiting English elementary schools hit on themes he never dropped. He complained that many of the schools in his district supplemented the minimal government support with steep student fees that generally exclude the children of the very poor. Even when arrangements are made for lower payments for poorer students, the situation does not improve. Teachers respond to those who pay the highest fees. Those who pay least are to be taught least. Consequently, able poor students are neglected. While those children who make the highest payments are put into the highest class, whether fit or not. Arnold remarked that a plan more calculated to derange and dislocate the instruction of a school would be difficult to imagine. A commitment to public education and service of national cultivation informed all his work. He took as the epigraph to schools and universities on the continent a line from the German humanist Wilhelm von Humboldt. The thing is not to let the schools and universities go in a drowsy and impotent rout, uh, routine. The thing is to raise the culture of the nation ever higher and higher by their means. He rejected throughout his life the attempt to put education on a cash basis. The state must support education to elevate all its citizens. 
the democratic and egalitarian thrust of his work surfaced in Arnold's 1861, The Popular Education in France, the product of a European visit sponsored by a Royal Commission on Education. His first chapter opened by citing the basic English credo that the state is inherently despotic and should be entrusted with as little as possible. Arnold disagreed. This approach sufficed when an aristocracy possessed the strength and spirit to run a country, but for England, the moment is past. This elite is no longer, this elite no longer can claim to be a superior class, and cannot stand above the inexorable democratic currents which Arnold blessed. Democracy, wrote Arnold, is trying to affirm one's own essence, meaning by this to develop one's own existence fully and freely, to have ample light and air to be neither cramped nor overshadowed. Phrases like ample light and air, which would later show up in culture and anarchy, appear here drenched in a democratic ethos. For Arnold, democracy and equality complemented each other and both invigorated a nation. The proof was France, where democracy and equality had triumphed, giving the common people a self-respect and an enlargement of spirit. The common people in France, stated Arnold, seems to me the soundest part of the French nation. Arnold never, tr Arnold never tired of denouncing inequality. If anything, he became increasingly sharp in his criticisms of material and economic inequalities. In the last decade of his life, he gave an address to England's largest working man's college. The fact of the talk itself sits uneasily with the image of Arnold as remote as the he told his working-class audience that three main problems faced England. The first, those immense inequalities of condition and property amongst us. As he explained in the essay, Equality, almost everyone in England defends equality before the law. The rub is social equality, which everyone opposes, since England is the home of the religion of inequality. The vast inequalities of property, Arnold believed, derive from the immense inequalities of class and property of the Middle Ages that are passed along in families. This freedom of bequest sanctions the inequalities and for that reason has been strictly curbed in many European nations. But not in England. Why? In principle, the English do not believe in abstract or natural rights of equality. Arnold agreed. It cannot be too often repeated, peasants and workmen have no natural rights, not one. Only we ought instantly to add that kings and nobles have none either. The point is simple. Property is created and maintained by law. It is not an abstract right. Hence, property can be regulated. That the power of disposal of property should be practically unlimited. That the inequality should be enormous or that the degree of inequality admitted at one time should be admitted always. This is by no means certain. Arnold went on to argue that right of bequest or the right to transfer property should be strictly regulated in order to diminish inequality and improve society. First of all, the well-being of the many must be pursued, not only for itself, but for the individual, for no one can be truly prosperous, happy, or even secure amid misery. It is here where Arnold sidles into his familiar argument. It is easy to see that our shortcomings in civilization are due to our inequality, or, in other words, that the great inequality of classes and property which came to us from the Middle Ages and which we maintain because we have the religion of inequality, that this constitution of things, I say, has the natural and necessary effect under present circumstances of materializing our upper, upper class, vulgarizing our middle class, and brutalizing our lower class, and this is to fail in civilization. Here he stated, it is easy to see. Elsewhere he stated, it is hard to see, but the point remains the same. And no one in England combines the fact of the defects in our civilization with the fact of our enormous inequality. People may admit the facts separately. <clears throat> the inequality, indeed, they cannot well deny, but they are not accustomed to combine them. Arnold combined them. His criticism of, of the coarseness of culture is driven by his egalitarian sympathies. 
an impoverished life and circumstances. Do not allow cultivation and growth. To put this differently, Arnold's criticism of mass culture is grounded in his democratic ethos. To this ethos, he appends two closely related propositions, both of which upset conservatives. The state must support education, and individuals by themselves lack the resources to remedy the social ills. Both precepts undermined a voluntarism or subjectivism that informed English Protestantism and life. Arnold recognized that in defending the right of free opinion and dissent, Protestants performed an invaluable service. Yet, the distrust of the state and the religion of self-help abandons the majority of people. In his address to the working man's college, Arnold cited a well-wisher who counseled who counseled the downtrodden to avoid the state and nourish self-reliance and self-help. For Arnold, English already suffered from a surfeit of self-reliance and self-help ideology. And ever since I was capable of reflection, I have thought that such cautions and exhortations might be wanted elsewhere, but that giving them perpetually in England was indeed carrying coals to Newcastle. The um, inutility, the profound inutility of too many of our liberal politicians comes from their habit of forever repeating, like parrots, phrases of this kind. Englishmen are not likely, you may be sure, to let the state encroach too much. Our dangers are all the other way. Our dangers are in exaggerating the blessings of self-will and self-assertion. The criticism of self-help, individualism, and puritanism formed the backbone of Arnold's cultural criticism. He challenged the idea, today more widespread than ever, that subjective reason is the last court of appeal, that what an individual feels or wants or desires brooks no argument. Arnold understood, as many social thinkers have, that the individual does not drop from the sky. He or she emerges out of social network. The I want or I need is also a social statement. This may seem obvious, but it also means that critical reason should not stand uh, mute before the whims and wishes of a population. The spirit of individualism, he wrote in Democracy, should not be taken for something it is not. It is a very, thi- it is a very great thing to be able to think as you like. But after all, an important question remains. What you think? Here, all the liberty and industry in the world do not guarantee high reason and a fine culture. He took this up in Culture and Anarchy in a chapter titled, Doing as One Likes. Our prevalent notion is that it is a most happy and important thing for a man merely to be able to do as he likes. On what he is to do when he is thus free to do as he likes, we do not lay so much stress. Arnold's insistence that we must consider the ends and not only the means constitutes his subversiveness. The issue was not simply the existence of formal freedom, but its content. Addressing the English burger, Arnold wrote, You think to cover everything by saying, We are free, we are free, our newspapers can say what they like. For Arnold, this did not suffice. Freedom, like industry, is a very good horse to ride, but to ride somewhere. You seem to think that you have only got to get on the back of your horse freedom or your horse industry and to ride away as hard as you can to be sure of coming to the right destination. He referred to a British utilitarian's stock argument for proving the greatness and happiness of England. May not every man in England say what he likes? Mr. Roebuck perpetually asks and that he thinks he is quite su- is quite sufficient and when every man may say what he likes our aspirations ought to be satisfied but the aspirations of culture are not satisfied unless what men say when they may say what they like is worth saying has good in it and more good than than bad on exactly these grounds arnold savaged a middle class that loved wealth and machinery in themselves with no notion of their ends or purposes. Your middle-class man thinks it the highest pitch of development in civilization when his letters are carried 12 times a day from Islington to Camberwell. 
and from Camberwell to Islington, and if railway trains run to and from between them every quarter of an hour. He thinks it is nothing that the trains only carry him from an illiberal, dismal life at Islington to an illiberal, dismal life at Camberwell, and the letters only tell him that such is the life there. The inability to evaluate the ends and the fetish of means characterizes what Arnold calls the Philistine. Arnold introduced the term Philistines in an essay on Hain, from whom he adopted the term. Perhaps we, the English, have not the word because we have so much of the thing. The Philistines, crabbed and limited members of the middle class, were closed to new ideas and experiences. They were humdrum people, slaves to routine, enemies to light, stupid and oppressive, but at the same time very strong. Although it might appear that Arnold was defending a spiritualized notion of the good life, it is almost the opposite. He savaged Puritans and ascetics as pinched in spirit and sensation. They were the bane of England. Culture flowered during the Elizabethan era. A few years afterwards, the great English middle class, the colonel of the nation, entered the prison of Puritanism and had the key turned on its its spirit there for 200 years. English, Puritan, English Puritanism killed pleasure and spirit. Indeed, one of the few things Arnold appreciated about the United States was a buoyancy, enjoyment, and freedom from constraint, missing in the English middle classes. <clears throat> the point is, Arnold did not defend sweetness and light as abstract goods. He defended a bountiful world against a cramped life of money and work. He quoted a doctor who wrote that the prosperous citizens of Liverpool, Liverpool were dying of boredom and atrophy. They lacked excitement. For Arnold, this was exactly right. People suffer from an immense ennui. They need stimuli and passion. Health cannot in general be maintained without nervous excitement. Money making is not enough by itself. Industry <coughs> Industry is not enough by itself. Seriousness is not enough by itself. The need in man for intellect and knowledge, his desire for beauty, his instinct for society, require to have their stimulus felt also, felt and satisfied. Arnold's ideas on culture are easy to lampoon, as he himself was well aware. By the end of his life, he regretted that the phrases he coined were losing their meaning. I am a nearly worn-out man of letters, he stated, with a frippery of phrases about sweetness and light, seeing things as they really are, knowing the best that has been thought and said in the world, which never had very much solid meaning, and have now quite lost the gloss and charm of, novel of novelty. Nevertheless, his ideas offer a perspective to judge popular culture. Undoubtedly, a fear of political unrest surfaces in Arnold's writings, notably in culture and anarchy, yet it surfaces, not determines. Arnold was fundamentally a critic of middle-class life and culture. For this reason, his importance as a critic only increases today. Middle-class culture has triumphed. Triumphed. <laughs> he once compared himself to William Cobbett, the English radical and advocate of the working classes whose politics were governed by one master thought, the thought of the evil condition of the English laborer. Arnold's master thought was the thought of the bad civilization of the English middle class. It is here that Arnold converges with other 19th century liberal thinkers who worried about increasing homogenization and uniformity of a democratic society. Tuckville noted that many contemporaries dreaded relentless change, but he feared the opposite, the perpetual stagnation in which people become more and more alike in ideas and opinions. Mill agreed, writing to Tocqueville, that the real danger in democracy is not anarchy or love of change, but Chinese stagnation and immobility. Mill criticized middle-class culture, but did not waver in his democratic and egalitarian sympathies. In discussing Tocqueville's Democracy in America, Mill argued that the Frenchman confused the effects of democracy with the effects of modern commercial society, 
and its middle class. <clears throat> Mill shared Tocqueville's concern about the tyranny over the mind and the growing insignificance of individuals in comparison with the mass. Yet these did not derive simply from democracy. All the intellectual effects which M. de Tocqueville ascribes to democracy are taking place under the democracy of the middle class. Like Mill's, Arnold's writings continue to resonate. The democratic criticism of democratic culture gains in import with the decline of radicalism. His objections to the glorification of mass culture in the name of relativism and freedom speak to the present. He stated that a kind of philosophical theory is widely spread among us, to the effect that there is no such thing as a pest as a best self, and a right reason. Consequently, we must accept the infinite number of ideas and realize that wisdom consists of perpetual give and take, with no right or wrong. For Arnold, the great promoters of these philosoph philosophical ideas are our newspapers, trumpeting that England enjoys unparalleled liberties of freedom. It is no use, quotes Arnold from the Times, for us to attempt to force upon our neighbors our several likings and dislikings. We must take things as they are. Everybody has his own little vision. Arnold did not accept the intellectual resignation that constitutes this pluralism, a, plural, a pluralism that today is everywhere. Nor did he defend what many erroneously believe is the opposite of pluralism, authoritarianism or elitism. Rather, Arnold believed that everyone in a democracy could be part of the elite. He rejected the private or individualist solution. Culture must be universal or it is nothing. Culture leads us to conceive no perfection as being real, which is not a general perfection, embracing all our fellow men with whom we have to do. Such is the sympathy which binds humanity together that we are indeed, as our religion says, members of one body, and if one member suffer, all members suffer with it. Individual perfection is impossible so long as the rest of mankind are not perfected along with us. Arnold offered something that has almost been lost, the democratic critique of democratic culture. The treatment of his work signals the atrophy of current political thinking, Conservatives and radicals can no longer grasp a thinker who does not neatly fit contemporary categories. Conservatives avoid Arnold where he champions the state, public education, and social equality, and where he savages the market. Liberals and leftists see only elitism, where Arnold assails individualism and philistinism. They no longer entertain a criticism of mass culture. Yet the old elitists like Arnold and MacDonald kept alive a vision of emancipation that the new critics extinguish in the name of the people.